Right. Hey, everybody, welcome to Unlocking Service Growth, episode number six. We're going to get rolling in just a minute. We have everybody start to come in. So if you are coming in, give us a shout in the chat what part of the country you're from and say hello to us. If you know Greg and myself, give us a wave. And uh, if you know our guest, give us a give us a, give him a hello as well. So welcome aboard and we will get started here in just a second. Um, if you guys don't know me, my name is Ryan Groth. I'm the CEO of Sales Transformation Group. We're a sales growth and transformation platform helping the industry grow and expand you know, grow predictability in their revenue and primarily focusing on their sales development. And uh, we also have our, our other host and partner in the show, Greg Hain. So uh, Greg, if, for those who don't, know, who don't know you, would you mind introducing yourself and letting everybody know what you do? I am Greg Hain with the Hain Coaching Group. Um, for the last 12, 14 years, I've been helping commercial roofing contractors grow their service departments. And... <clears throat> I also, um, I have, I am and have been a um, uh, commercial roofing consultant for 20 some years. And um, that's really informed my ability to help contractors um, on the the service side, because I know what knowledgeable building owners want. Um, But of course, Ryan, one of the points to be made in in this introduction is the fact that um, you really are great at helping contractors generate revenue. And although I deal with that some in my program, also I am more about the nuts and the bolts and on the operational side. And so this really creates a great balance um, and um, when we come together. For sure. And the reason why we started this show and we started it uh, over a year ago is we both a, uh, love the industry and know there's opportunity and we're both helping the industry. But B, uh, we wanted to make a devoted focus on service specifically because there's a lot of commercial contractors here. And the more you listen to these shows, the more you're around us, the more you know that service, that strategy is the, uh, is the key to helping grow a dream business. You know, and I know when I say dream business, it doesn't mean it's without its problems, but on paper, it can become a very uh, successful business that can help you uh, you know, leave a legacy business, build something valuable, uh, attract high, high performing talent and just build a great place to work. And so uh, what we want to do is just bring on uh, guests that have a great amount of experience that can, they can give you insights and help you understand what you can do to uh, avoid some of your own mistakes and to actually learn from others. And I think that's uh, the epitome of wisdom is to learn from your mistakes, but also learn from others. And I think if you guys uh, are, are listening today, you're going to walk away um, with something that can really change and unlock the next level of growth. So put, put down your phones, unless you're watching it on your phone, uh, get away from your next appointment necessarily, make sure your calendar is clear and don't get too distracted because I want you to buckle in and uh, extract a lot of value from this, from this meeting today. So, so Greg, uh, why don't you um, introduce our special guest? And, um, and just so you guys know, here's how this works. Typically the first 30 minutes are going to be a lot of interview style questions with our guests. And then the latter half of the call that typically lasts about an hour, we're gonna leave room for question and answer. So if you're on this call and you're like burning with some questions, we're gonna get those, uh, we're gonna get to those and we'll get to those at the end of uh, the second half of this interview and the session here. And uh, I hope that you know we get to your questions. If we don't, we apologize, send us an email and we will follow up with how we can help you. So Greg, uh, why don't you uh, welcome our guest and introduce him and. Uh, begin the process here today. And, and by the way, if you do have questions, type them in as they come to you. Don't wait until we ask for them. Um, that would make it a little cleaner for everyone. I have been so excited about this particular uh, podcast. I just been because Kyle, Kyle King of James King Roofing um, has been a, an acquaintance, a, a professional acquaintance of mine for now over 10 years. And um, uh, I have, he's become a friend. And so when I have an opportunity to to interview a friend, it's always great fun. So Kyle, I met Kyle under rather unusual circumstances. In my role as roofing consultant, we had a roofing contractor and Kyle is in the Seattle market. And we had a contractor in the Seattle market, a very reputable contractor, and their service department was really pretty bad. 
And finally, I needed to find somebody else, and which I don't like to do. I mean, I try to make it work with who we have, but it wasn't working. I finally reached out to someone. They said, you need to call. And they gave me the name of the company, which we're going to, a very fine company. It's a $100 million company, but you need to call the service manager's name's Kyle King. So I called Kyle on the phone. I said, Kyle, I've got this situation. Would you help us out? He said, sure. And before we hung up the call, he said, now, would you please do something for me? Kyle, do you remember what that was? Yeah, I do. And I have done it many times. Uh, I asked you to email your information, contact information, building information to our service email address. Correct? Correct. You said, please do not call me. Please email that. We have multiple people that monitor that. That way your call will not get dropped. And what he did not know was the reason we were replacing the other guy is because that guy insisted that we email all of our service requests directly to him. So I literally got off the phone with Kyle and sent an email to my client and said, we're not going to have any trouble with this guy. And he immediately proved me right. So since then, he opened a branch office uh, for their main company. And then about three, three and a half, four years ago, he left there over some differences of uh, principle and started James King Roofing. So one of the things that I wanted to be sure you were all clear on is the fact that that he started three years ago, and although he has nine trucks now, um, he still had to get started. And and after and I asked him earlier, I said, "How many did you have after six months?" He's had four. All right. So the messages, the questions that you need to be asking today are around. Okay, we understand that he had he had to get some. He took some of his customers with him. That's maybe not as easy as it sounds, but he had to be doing something right in three years to over double that. He's got nine trucks now. So I suggest that you be great in listening because he's got a lot to offer because he's done this before and he knows how to make it happen. So with that, Kyle. Can I um, add something real quick? Greg? Yeah, of course. Sure. And I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. <laughs> I just... We'll talk a lot about this as we move on, but uh, it just takes some, some basic principles and providing service is more than just doing a leak repair or doing maintenance. Um, there's a lot more to it. And really your customer is partially interested in getting leaks taken care of and roofs back into condition and things like that. But it's about them being taken care of quickly and getting responded to and knowing something's happening on the roofer's end. Thank you. Sorry. No, no, that's weird. <laughs> so when we were chatting, as we were getting our technology sorted out, um, I said, um, Kyle, how, how many production crews do you have now? You have? We have five. And the next question I ask you is, if you had no service department, how many production crews would you have? Maybe two. We've, so we've got nine service crews moving right now. We've got five production crews. We had, if we didn't have the service uh, crews running that we do, we'd have half or less than half of the production work we have. So service drives your production. I want it to drive our production. Okay. How do you, how do you go about doing that? Building relationships, building rapport, getting in, getting to know your customers and they're all a little different. Um, and then when time comes, when you've serviced them and done a good job servicing them, and the time comes for a re roofing job, you've got a distinct advantage over your competition. And I talk to our customers openly about that. I'm, I'm, it's not a big secret. I don't expect favors. I just know that if they know you and they know how you perform and your people perform, you're going to have an advantage. And I want to negotiate work. I don't want a hard bid work. Oh. And when you negotiate work, the how are the margins? They're, it's amazing. They're a little better. <laughs> and, all, and all it takes is everybody out there knows it doesn't, 
doesn't have to be 20% better re-roofing um, gross margin. It just needs to be five, six, 7% better. That makes a huge difference. Um, the other question that I wanted to ask you was um, about staffing. So you have nine trucks. How many, how many people are in the office that are, do the coordination of this, the, the operational execution? So in the office, we have a service manager and a service coordinator. And each of our service crews, our nine trucks are two-man crews. Okay. So the reason I'm asking that question, so in other words, one coordinator, one uh, service manager, um, and they're due, they do nine trucks. Correct. Okay, how many more trucks can that coordinator handle? Oh, probably another four. Okay, fine. Yeah. He's not He's not overloaded. And there's times, because we're in Seattle when we're overloaded and, and it gets a little frantic. Customers never know that. Um, but in general, he could probably handle four more service crews. Great. Ryan, do you, yeah. do you have some, some sure. curiosities here? Yeah. So how do you go about um, generating the interest and, and the, getting the market to be aware of your, uh, I mean, because I know you came from another company. So kind of walk us through that journey. How did you acquire customers uh, through service? T tell me, how does that work? And then do you have uh, any sales process or sales people that represent and uh, how do they go about getting, getting work and uh, getting on new customers and growing new customers, growing existing customers? Yeah, we are heavily into um, property management firms as opposed to maybe industrial customers and not with any intent because um, we'll work with industrial customers just as easily. But since I started working for my family's business years ago, I got involved in associations like BOMA, IFMA, NAOP, all those different types of associations. And just made, number one thing you need to do is make people aware that you're interested in doing service work. Don't just assume that, that they know because they, my, my experience has been that most customers, property management customers, have experience with roofers, but it's not the kind of roofer that they, tip, they really want. They need to be shown a lot of attention. So we've done a lot of association work. Uh, I've recently kind of passed that along to some younger people because the people that I knew when I first moved to Seattle have grown out of property management. They're moving up the ladder, leaving me behind, and the younger people are now taking over. So it's really important that I introduce and pass that torch on to other people to be involved in those meetings. You've got to attend them regularly. So that's one way we've done it is through heavy association involvement. Um, as far as a sales team goes, we're a relatively new company. Um, it's a little early in our life to be doing a formal sales operation, but we'll talk about that someday, Ryan. Um, yeah. But uh, I just I tell everybody from our receptionist to our uh, fleet manager to our foreman that they are all salespeople, and they constantly have to be paying attention to how they're doing things, how they're presenting themselves, how they're representing the company because they're all salespeople, they're all business development people. And at some point we'll formalize that, but I don't think I'll ever lose that philosophy that everybody in the company is a person at all times. Gotcha, yeah. So um, when you're working with somebody who has an existing relationship with a roofing contractor, and when you started out of the gate, that, that was certainly the case. And, and I'm, I would imagine you still deal with that. Uh, what is it, how do you, how do you find yourself being in a position where they're ready to fire that existing roofer and hire you as their roofer? What, what takes place for that to happen typically? And is it easy or is it not easy? Is it what's, what's, in, what's involved? Yeah, it's, it's, I'm a pretty patient guy when it comes to that. We're obviously introducing ourselves and sharing our story and what we do to our to new potential customers all the time. Usually what it takes is a, a roofer, mistake over and over and again sort of like what greg talked about when we first met somebody mm -hmm. performing for them it wasn't the first time it happened they're fed up and they are looking for somebody new and as long as you and as you're, you're prepared with your elevator speech tell them about how you work your business and how we treat our customers and how we handle our business 
um, you, the door opens and then you jump on that opportunity right away. We've got it set up and I have such good people working with me that uh, it, all it takes is one opportunity. They see the difference and they're our customer. It's, it's relatively easy. So I'd love to hear a couple of things. One is um, I think you do a great job with your branding. I've noticed like even in our email exchanges, your signature has prof is professional. You, you productize your, your proactive your maintenance program. You, I think you call it Excalibur. And um, that's one thing I notice with every great service business that I work with is they've, they've really kind of productized and named that, that uh, product of, Hey, now you're one of our, you're one of our best customers. You've gone this far with us. You've, you not only are you hiring us to fix leaks, but you're letting us consult you and get out in front of these leaks. And, and you're really letting us do our job the right way. And thank you for that kind of thing. I noticed that about you and your branding. And I want to know how important is that? And then secondly, um, I love to hear what is the, what are some of the things you're immersing the, the, your mind of your teammates to, to truly be an exceptional service provider? I noticed speed is something in communication uh, a couple of different times. So how, how as a leader, I know we're going to have people who are being tasked to start divisions of commercial from a residential department, or maybe they're the owner and they're ready to make a pivot. Uh, what, is, what, is, what needs to be happening here in the mind of a leader uh, with A, the brand, and then B, the, how the people are going to behave in order to be exceptional at, the, at service? Yeah. Um... I brand, I brand the company, I remind everybody that our brand is service and responsiveness, and our brand is a, a list of things I'm going to mention to you here in a minute in response to your second question. Um, but you, we constantly are out in front of our customers. I want people to think when they think roof, when they wake up in the morning, they normally don't wake up thinking, God, I can't wait. I hope it's going to be raining hard in Seattle. I hope I have a bunch of service leak work that I can deal with today. That's not what they're thinking when they get up. What I want them to think when they Oh, it's going to be a lot of rain in Seattle this weekend. I'm just going to, I know that I can get a hold of James King Ripping. They're going to respond to my call quickly and they're going to get on it and keep me posted throughout the process. Then I, they can go on and work on things they enjoy doing because I don't, I haven't found any customer yet who enjoys dealing with roof leaks. So in preparation for this podcast, I, I keep a list called the win loss bulletin. When people send us compliments, we put it on the list. When we have complaints, or suggestions we put on the list and I shared it with all of our people at one at least once a week. I went through that list in preparation for the podcast and let me tell you real quick Ryan what the number one responses were when people were we were we're thinking that responding to an email right away, responding to a phone call right away, get, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about responsiveness along the whole line of the process, from the first call to the email and response to the tell somebody where we're at in providing the service they're requesting and completing it. Number two was work habits. We get compliments on our guys and their work habits on site. So the field guys are, are a very important part of the process. Mm -hmm. Number three was we go above and beyond. We get comp that kind of compliment quite a bit. Number four is attention to detail. Those types of things um, people tend to like and we're reliable. So we're consistent in all those aspects. And if there's any inconsistency, there's somebody notices it along the line within the team and we get it squared away. So those are the that's things great. That we hear from our customers. That's, that's awesome. How, how do you demonstrate attention to detail? And then how do you demonstrate above and beyond? Attention to detail is making sure we get all the information we need in order to be able to be productive when we get on a site. And I'm, I'm talking about leak service work because this is where a lot oftentimes the relationship starts with one simple leak call. So making sure when you're taking that information, whether it's via email or phone, you're getting all the information you need to pass along to your guys so they don't fumble around on site, waste the, com the, the customer's money, frustrate the tenants and things like that. So that's an important thing to do. What was your second question, Ryan? Uh, the, the above and beyond. How, oh, yeah. how is that demonstrated like with your people in the field? Yeah, one, I, one example would be when we're out on a leak service call, our guys are asked to do a thorough investigation. So they're up in ceiling tile. They don't just go like we used to do. 
look for a car out through the window, know that it's somewhere in line with that car, know that it's 10 feet from that wall. They get up inside of the ceiling grid or inside, put a ladder up inside and really investigate the inside interior where that water is coming from. That helps them once they get on the roof. Um, so getting the information to the guys, the guys aren't frustrated, they got all the information and then paying attention to detail when you're invoicing. We invoice within two days of when we're off a job and, and making sure that invoice is detailed so people don't have to, they don't have to feel like they need to call us back and go, well, I don't really understand what you guys did and you sent me a $1,500 bill. It's well documented and explained in photo and in writing in an invoice and those invoices get paid quick, quickly. Um, if I can jump in here for a second. Thanks, Kyle. Um, for all of those of you that are listening in, one of the things I will tell you about Kyle is that he is one of the best communicators I work with. And so, for instance, when we were setting up this podcast, if I would send an email to Kyle, I typically get an answer in five minutes. Now, he's running a company. He has five production crews. He has nine service trucks, but he manages to figure out how to rep reply promptly to communication. And you all need to do this too. And if you're the boss, you're the guy that needs to lead the parade. Because there's, if you're not responding to emails promptly, you're given permission to all of your employees to be sloppy with their communication as well. So if you wanna see people performing well when it comes to communication, you have to also. And by the way, most of you don't. So, so wanted to make that clear because Kyle, that's something you're not as aware of it, that I am. Yeah, you've got to let the customer know that you want their business. And if you take a half a day to get back to somebody, uh, and this is to people like Greg, to our suppliers, if they have questions, I get back to them or I ask our people to get back to them just as quickly because that makes it, makes working with you easier. And that's all we want to do is make our make who we're working with their job easier. Okay? So is half a day okay or is half a day too long? I'd say half a day is too long. Thank you. Definitely not a day. Don't wait a day. If somebody emails me or emails our service manager or our coordinator at 7.30 at night, they get a response. Because my philosophy is if our customers are working because they have an emergency situation at 7.30 at night, James King Roofing is working. And all it takes most times is a, hey, I understand you need some help. What can we help you with? Do you need it tonight? Do you need it tomorrow? Give me that information and you're off and running. They know that you're interested in taking care of their tenants. That's all it takes, but you can't let it sit because it shows disinterest. And I'm, and none of our people here are disinterested in work that pays the bills. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very good. I have a couple more questions. Please, um, Ryan. Uh, you mentioned BOMA, IFMA. There was another that I'm not familiar with that you shared. That, can you repeat that other association? NAOB. NAOB. Association of Industrial uh, Properties. Okay, cool. Um, I think I misspelled it. Maybe Greg, you can help me there. But uh, so um, another question I might have is, you know, I, I think a lot of people uh, do time and material. They're they're reactive to the request of the customer, which sounds like you are very much responsive to them in a very quick fashion. Can you talk a little bit about how your philosophy is with, with that? Do you, do you like to remain in that, that respond well, time and material? Do you go into more of a, uh, a consultative approach ever and step into here's we think we should, here's what we found and here's what else we recommend you do or else it might, you know, how does those, how do those conversations go as a service provider? And then how does that affect your revenues when it comes to you know, what, how much is time material versus how much do you find is contract work and scope of work where, you know, um, they sent a proposal for and they had a list out of, of items. Yeah, like I, like I said, the leak work is the first taste they get of James King Roofing, how we operate. It's typically on time and material basis. Sometimes it's time and material not to exceed. We have to watch that very closely because the last thing we want to do is send a, a bill that's over the, the time not to exceed amount. So we communicate with the field very closely on how much time they have and handle that. And then that moves us into, uh, uh, once we work that relationship, then we're working on, well, hey, we've got this building that leaks. Can you guys go out and take a look and let me know what it needs? And then we start hard coding work, okay? So we call those 
that work, corrective repair work as in preparing the roof to put it under our roof asset management program. That's not always the case, but the corrective repair is a once over, maybe twice over at this, on the same day for the entire roof. And those are hard coded. That's hard coded work. Margins between the two are, are basically the same. I try to keep them the same. Um, we've got, we might want to talk about employee uh, pay and all that kind of thing. Our guys are highly paid, but they're very, very good at what they do. Um, so if they're good and we're doing leaks and we're getting the leaks stopped the first time out, not the second time out, not using the excuse that, oh, roofing leaks are hard to find. Yeah, they can be hard to find sometimes. I understand that. But 80% of the time, they're not hard to find. You just need people who are interested and care about finding that leak and have a drive to find the leak to get it taken care of the first time. Then we start quoting hard quoting corrective repairs. And then we hard, we always hard quote RAM work at the same time we're quoting corrective repair work, whether the customer asked for it or not. They would need to do the corrective work before they can Correct. do the RAM work, but you quote it simultaneously. Yep. And at the same time, um, and uh, what's what's typically can you explain uh what's entailed on the on the roof at the ram work like what just just walk us through that what's uh, a common uh, you know solution you would offer for ram work yeah once okay so you're absolutely right ryan correct repair work must be done before we 99 percent of the time there's correct work that needs to be done before we're willing to put it under the ram program there are times when the roofs are new um, that they don't need corrective repairs or somebody has been doing a decent job maintaining them up to the point of meeting us and they don't need corrective repairs. So that, that needs to be made clear. Um, and, and it sometimes gets difficult to explain to customers, but if you walk them through it, once they understand how the process works, then they get it next time around. Um, as far as RAM work goes, just so everybody knows, um, once a roofing, a roof system is put under our RAM program, we guarantee the roof won't leak at areas where we're responsible for taking care of the roof and it's predictable leak location. So if you're really good at doing leak work and you guys have, you have experienced guys out there, when you go and do ram work in good weather in the fall, in the spring and fall or fall only, they know, they should know where to go and spend their time on the roof because they know if these items aren't addressed, these components of the roof system aren't addressed, they're going to leak and guess who's going to have to pay for it? James King roofing. So, there, and there's times it's not perfect. I don't get super upset unless we're going back on a certain building over and over again. And I notice, or our service manager notices that we're doing repair work. We're repairing leaks at items that are predictable leak locations. Somebody is not doing their job. So that's sort of the process. And then we typically maintain these roofs for quite some time. We're not afraid to tell them. And it's pretty obvious when we start sending invoices for non-predictable leaks, because splits in the roof are not predictable. Nails backing out through the roof are not predictable. Those things we bill for, we bill at a reduced RAM rate, but it becomes obvious to us and to the customer that it's time to be thinking about replacing the roof. And then we start having that discussion. And now we're in that place we talked about earlier where we're negotiating a job. Great. I have two questions. One is how are you finding in uh, your, your talent to, in the field? Is that something that you are um, kind of always on the hunt for recruiting consistently is a constant training. Talk about that. And then secondly, uh, after you go into that, I'd like for you to talk about um, that. Actually, I lost my second question, so it'll come back to me. I have a question. So after he answers, I'll ask mine. Yeah, one at a time, you guys. <laughs> okay, one question at a time. <laughs> um, as far as finding employees, uh, we benefited for most of our employees we have now that they came, they followed me from where I was before and followed a couple of other people from other places before. So that's been helpful. Um, the, the point of that is that don't assume that your employees are happy with you. They may not be, they may be just looking for the next place to go. That's better. And we make sure we take very, very good of our, uh, care of our employees. We pay them well, they get great benefits. Um, and the word gets out. Um, Seattle is no different than anywhere else in the United States, I'm assuming. It's a, it's a relatively small industry and the word gets out. This is the place not to work. This is a place to work because this is the way that company operates and this is the way this company operates and things like that. It's relatively straightforward to me um, that if you're treating your employees fair and consistently, 
take, taking good care of them, if they're taking good care of the company, they're, they're, the word's going to get out. People are going to start coming to you. And that's, that's how it's worked for us. Now, the, the question that I have is more of a point to make. Um, when we start talking about the RAM program, Excalibur, I believe is how you brand it, um, service contractors just really get all excited about trying to sell these. And I want to point out and make very explicit that what Kyle's company does is provide stellar communication. And if you're not having that coordinator respond to the email at 7.30 at night, if you're not getting your invoices out promptly, if you're not, if it's taking you over a half a day to get back to a customer, your efforts to sell roof management programs are going to fail. They are not easy sales. They come from credibility and credibility comes from you from communication. You're absolutely right, Greg. And, and again, I don't mean to keep saying this, but it, it starts with the simple leak call. And then you work through leaks and they see how you perform consistently with leaks. And then they have you do corrective repairs and you do a good job and the roof is not leaking like it used to. And then they start to show interest in this RAM program. Excalibur, by the way, is what we is our FCF software. That's what we brand okay. FCF software. Okay. Uh, RAM program uh, it is not an easy sell. I mean, we're not hard sellers, um, but we present it and they see that we're effective in our corrective repair efforts and our leak repair efforts. Why would be, we be any less good at doing maintenance work? And I always tell them, like I said earlier, the only people out doing your RAM work are the guys that do leak work all winter long. And who better to go do repairs on a roof than the guys that are out doing leak repairs all winter long on roofs that aren't maintained? It's that is a great sales point. That is a fantastic sales yeah. point. By the way, we've we've um, we had no RAM programs when we started. We've got probably in three years, a little more than three years, probably 350 buildings under the RAM program. And it sort of just takes care of itself. It snowballs after a certain point. You do have to bring it up to customers you don't deal with, but some customers have you doing RAM work on some of their buildings because the owners of those buildings are believers in the benefit of maintaining things. Some owners that that same property manager is working for aren't believers in maintaining things. And the, but the property manager now sees that it makes sense to maintain things and starts to talk to the property owner is not a maintenance believer, and they start to convince them. They're, they become salespeople for you, the property manager. So I have two That's more questions. The first is, um, of the people on the RAM program, when it's time to replace that roof, what percentage of those do you get to negotiate? I would say probably... 50% of them. Okay. And, and, that does, and that, so we negotiate them, Greg. We probably close a little less than that because it still comes down oftentimes to price. You can't deny that. It's just the way it is. Um, but we're, we're increasing. And my, and my goal, as you mentioned earlier, when we were talking before we started, um, would be to negotiate 100% of our work and not go spinning our wheels, trying to bid work where we don't know who we're bidding against, we don't know the customer and things like that. So the goal and the point of the RAM program is to take care of customers, take care of their buildings, save them the expense of um, team, time and material leak calls all winter long, um, but to, to, to provide these opportunities to negotiate work. The second question I have is a completely different question. How often do you fire a customer and what, on what grounds do you fire them? Ah, we don't fire customers very often. Back before I started James King Roofing, when I was working for my family's business that's very large, um, I would fire customers more than I wanted to. And I had a hard time come, coming to terms with firing a customer because I've always been like, well, it's business, it's business, it's business. Um, but I, it was quickly pointed out to me, but it took a little while for me to absorb it, that there's just some customers that aren't in alignment and have the same philosophy of taking care of their roofs. Um, as most of our customers do. So I don't I answer your question, Greg. I don't have to fire people very often, but there's times that I contemplate and I've gotten better at having the serious discussions with these customers about how we do our work and avoiding that situation where we have to part ways. Fair enough. Thank you. 
Yeah. Brian, should we jump to some of the? Uh, um... Yeah. Yeah, we should do that. Um, Kyle, this has been really helpful. Uh, yes, Kyle. Thank, thank you. you for sharing. Yeah, thank you. So we've got some questions and um, we'll go one at a time. So uh, uh, we got a question around, uh, can, uh, here we go. If you are going to start, if you're a residential business and you've been tasked to start and build a commercial division from scratch, if you were in um, Michael Smoot shoes, where would you start? Oh, I've got another list for you guys. <laughs> Excuse me. So, so one of the things that Greg wanted to talk about, and I know you did too, is how to quickly get a service business off the ground and run it. Um, probably number one is fully commit to it. Uh, don't want to do it half-hearted. And, and it doesn't mean throw 10 bodies at it and go buy nine trucks. It's find somebody in your firm or find somebody outside your firm who is a service-minded person and put them in charge. Have them start going to BOMA meetings and NAOP meetings and IFA meetings and things like that. Um, but you've got to commit 100% to a service division and, and find somebody to do that and let them do their thing. Uh, set up an email account, right, Greg? But it, it, I don't think it costs us anything. We have a certain amount of email accounts we can have. Set up a service at myroofingcompany.com, assign it to that number one person, and another person and set up um, a schedule to for them to be on call. So they shouldn't go into new construction. Or at least 24 seven, I'm sorry, Ryan. Go they ahead. shouldn't go into new construction roofing you're saying? No. Just joking. Right. <laughs> it screws things up. So yeah. I wanna wait, I wanna jump in on this. Yeah. Um, I have been training service contractors for over 12 years. I only know of two contractors that went from doing residential work to commercial, went from, actually, and both these contractors didn't go from residential to commercial service. These were commercial, these were contractors that were working in commercial businesses that started their own company to do service. Going from residential to commercial service is extremely difficult. You have, because it's much more complicated. May, a, a, a typical shopping center is going to have eight, nine, 10 roofs on it. One's going to be John's Manville, a couple are going to be Carlisle, a couple are going to be GAF, <laughs> some are going to be Firestone. They want you to service all these under warranty. You call those manufacturers, they're not going to set you up if you're not going to be installing their products. So going from residential to commercial service is very difficult. Plus, the reality is if you do a job for them on service like Kyle does, I can tell you what's going to happen next. They're going to call you on the phone and they're going to tell you, we need to have a new roof and you're going to do it. Though I know only know of two companies that did this. One was a Tremco rep. And all he did was take off his Tremco hat and put on his own company hat. And the other was a couple of guys that, that, that were brothers that were partners that went into business. And uh, last year they did, um, about $8 million in service, but they did a total of $25 million. Okay, only about 30% of their business was service because they won't let you just do service if you're good at it. And if you're not good at it, they won't call you. Yeah, so you're, I, right. you're right. And I think uh, I, that, that just recently, uh, recently I became aware of that when I started James King Ruffin, I was like, Hey, we need to be approved by you guys. You, I was, you know, I, we did service on your work here. You know who I am, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, you mean you're not going to do, you know, you just want to do service work and you're not going to be installing our product on larger re-roofing and doing volume with us. Well, that's not our intent. Well, I quickly had to change our model a little bit, quickly had to change our model a little bit. And, and, uh, and once we started doing production work, we were able to tell our customers or our uh, suppliers, hey, we can do this. They, they started coming in line. So you're absolutely right, Greg. You got to be willing to do both. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it can't be done. I don't know anybody that's gone from residential to commercial and done it successfully by only doing service. My recommendation is go install roofs. They're going to leak. Then you're going to have to go fix them. And pretty soon, if you do enough of this, you have enough for a truck. And now you got one truck. Um, the other question that we have from Mike, can you explain a bit about your on-call procedure? 
Is it answered by an on, is it answered by an on call service system? Do you have an employee that actually answers it? If the employee doesn't answer, uh, then who does? Uh, how many on call days do employees have? How are they rotated? How are they paid? Um, can you can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we do use an answering service, um, and be careful in choosing your answering services because they're not all the same. Um, so our, our answering service takes over at our office at about 3.30. Uh, they've got a list of questions that we've defined for them to ask, so we make sure we get all the information we need um, as much as we can. That gets dispatched out via email to our on-call office person. And only up till recently did I get taken off that list. Um, and they're on call for a week. So that person is responsible for either emailing or calling that person back and asking some more questions. And then we've got people in the field. We usually have one service crew of two people on call all the time throughout the year. Whether it's 85 degrees and sunny, they're still on call. Um, and then in the winter time, when things start to get a little more uh, exciting around here, we'll put two people, two service crews on call. And that usually handle, we can usually handle most of that with those service crews. The service crews get, each person gets $100 a day just for, or a week just for being on call, okay? Whether they get a call or not. And plus they get OT for being on call or having to go out and do service work. So it's $100 on top of their OT pay um, for doing service work after hours. Does that, did that answer all the questions or? And if there's, um, I can always answer them. Well, let, if, if, if that did a nice job of explaining it. And if you'd like, if whoever asked that, if they want to follow up with more, go right ahead. Yeah, that was uh, my God for you if he's got another yeah, question. And, and I, but I would like to call everyone's attention to the fact that Kyle's name was on that list. The owner of the company is on that list. When he talks about having a service focus, that doesn't mean they go do it. He lives this. This isn't something you delegate. He will get the calls if somebody else doesn't answer. This is not something you delegate. Yeah, you've got to be willing to do it yourself. And I'm still more than willing to do it myself. I just think uh, at some point, I think at some point, the guys and gals here had said, Kyle, we don't need you anymore. <laughs> you, we can handle this on your, and, and they felt like I was like overseeing or babysitting it. And maybe to some degree I was, um, but at some point they said, Kyle, we don't need you anymore. And, and that was a huge compliment. And, they, and, and I have trust to see these and I don't need to be a part of the process unless they need me. And I'm available Great. to them all the time as well. That's awesome. Great leadership. Um, Ken Fur wants to know more about how negoti negotiating contracts works versus hard bids. If Kyle wouldn't mind giving an example of how those negotiations go. I think that'd be great. Yeah. Um, most of our customers are required because again, they're institutional property managers, things like that are required to get a bid. I want three bids, I want five bids. Um, the, the beauty of having a relationship with a property manager or a building owner um, is that you can oftentimes write the specification um, and write a good one. Don't send over a five line specification for $250,000 job. There's more to a $250,000 job than five lines of spec, okay? Mm. Um, so make sure do that, you start defining the specification and you define it, not necessarily what's best for you. It's always going to be what's best for the customer first and, and for the particular prop property. Um, and then maybe weave in there something that you might be better than somebody else and start working on that. Then it's just simply uh, um, where do we need to be? Um, who else am I bidding out? You can start to get a lot more information from a, a, a customer you have a relationship in the process of quoting work about who you're bidding against and things like that. Maybe how the property owner uh, operates and things like that. And you start to, the more information you have, the more, more apt you are to get the job, and be able to form your specification around it. Kyle just something, said something very, very, very important. He said, when you do this, you do what's best for the customer, not what's best for you. And this is a mindset that very few roofing contractors actually, they may say they do that, but that's not my experience. When I get scopes of work from contractors 
where they're quoting stuff for repairs. I get out a red pen and say, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. They, they look foolish for all the stuff they try to get me to pay for. That's the norm. Does this really need to be done? If the answer is no, don't quote it. Yeah, bottom line is you just you want to keep the building dry and keep tenants dry. And if it if there's something you if there's something that you are tempted to put down as a, as part of the scope of the work and including the price, if it's not for the good of the company or for prolonging the life of the roof, don't include it. Right, Greg? I think that's the point. I, I, I mean, it doesn't need it in three years, maybe, but they may right. sell the building next year. You know, yeah. fix what you need to fix short term. Have an expectation of what that time frame might be. We're going to try to keep you dry for a year or whatever, but we're not going to try to fix anything. It might leak for the next eight. We've got yeah. another question that came in, that has come in. That, one more thing. Keep, yeah. Keep please. away from what will help you with what Greg just said is keep away from template proposals as much as you can. Don't just have, oh, it's a built up roof. This is what, if that's what you have and you want to use that, that's fine. But start taking out those things that don't need to happen on that roof because people will read these. And if they're repeat customers, there's like, Kyle's just regurgitating the same old stuff. And isn't there anything different on these roofs? And I always tell our people here, your, your report looks exactly the same as the one that you did on a, the roof yesterday. There's got to be a difference. There's got to be a difference. So don't just use templates, put some thought. And talk. People will notice that because they'll start to see a difference in your proposals each time you send out a report. And notice again, everyone, that the owner of the company is reviewing the scopes of work that the service estimators are putting out to make sure they rep, they're representative of what's in the best interest of the customer. This isn't something you delegate. This is something you're immersed in. We have a, a, another question here from uh, Jamie. Uh, when you get a call, is the expectation that the tech that goes out is gonna diagnose it and fix it? Or does he have some sort of a price sheet and some way of, of producing an estimate? Yeah, no, Jamie, we don't, um, we don't allow our guys to do it. There's probably some people I know there's people in the field who could do that, work out an estimate on site, but no, no most, when we're called out to do a leak call, we do it, we get the leak stop time material. And if there's additional work that needs to be done, our techs are asked to make sure to take photos and pass those along to the office so an estimator can put a price together. Yeah, Jamie, in the residential world, you gotta give them a price. In the commercial world, don't you dare give them a price. Two men in a truck, minimum two hours, uh, or whatever your minimum needs to be. And if they won't hire you, on, and they will hire you, but if they won't hire you, they're not going to be a customer. And if you're, and if you're good, real quick, because I don't want to pass this up. If you're really good at what you do from start to finish, don't be afraid to charge for it. I'm not going to talk about pricing or anything like that, but don't be afraid to charge for it because people will value what you do and they will pay for value. If you provide a lot of value, you can charge handsomely for it. Not overcharge because you want these to be long-term relationships, but don't be afraid to charge for it. You're in business for profit, not for nonprofit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, JD Anguist has uh, asked what uh, technology or software has been vital to quoting, tracking, and executing your service work. Yeah, um, right now um, we're using FCS. Which we call, which we brand as Excalibur at James King Roofing. Um, it, it's been great. Um, if you decide you want to get into something like um, FCS, dive in big. Don't just use the periphery thing. Make sure you get to know it really well. I'm not a high tech person, but our service manager is really good with FCS. And so if I ask him, if, if I'm writing a report um, and I want to change it up a little bit and make it look different than other FCS reports, I go to him. Or if I need to do, if we need to work out a dispatch situation, Evan is really, really good at working through um, the system and making it work for our customers. But they is work. that the uh, Java or is that the the FCS? It's FCS. Okay. For now. Got it. Great. <clears throat> and um, yeah, if we have, if you guys have any more questions, we have a few more minutes. Uh, we can probably take one or two more. If anybody has one. Um, so Kyle, how do you plan to grow 
do you plan to grow or do you just grow with how, like, do you make any plans to grow your business and service? Uh, or do you, do you uh, just kind of respond to how the market's responding to your great service? Yeah. Um, right now, Ryan, we, we're, we're kind of in organic, uh, organic growth, so to speak. I mean, there's intent behind um, building relationships and things like that. Um, but we're, just, we're trying to make sure we can keep up with the business that we have now and not stub our toes and, and overloading ourselves. But right now we're kind of growing organically, letting things, letting the process sort of take care of itself. But there's definitely a, a time in the future where we'll put some formalized sales effort together with somebody like you. Um, yeah. We don't have the depths at three years in the, in the bandwidth right now to, to overload ourselves. And that's the last thing I want to do is overload ourselves and not be able to have, take care of our current customers. Yeah, Kyle, Tina has asked this question in the chat now twice, so we better get it asked. <laughs> Sorry, Tina. So <laughs> how do you handle revenue generation, sales? I call it revenue generation. Um, do you have salespeople? Do you have account managers? Do you have estimators? How do you go out and get, how do you go get work? Yeah, um, we don't have salespeople. Like I said earlier, uh, everybody is a salesperson, but in our service department, Evan, or our service manager, he's writing, He's going out inspecting roofs and doing a lot of uh, proposal writing. Me, um, I'm helping in that effort because I know it helps in the bigger picture, um, but I'm trying to phase myself out to some degree at there. So our next, our next move is to hire somebody who has some field knowledge, who can go out and look at a roof, evaluate it, write a decent proposal, um, put, a, put a price together, an estimate together that's worthy, and then send it off. But Right now, at our, at our point in our life, uh, it's pretty basic. It's just estimators are doing the proposals. And we're all out doing sales. That's fine. And I can get into that more deeply if, if somebody wants to send me an email. I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about that over the phone or something like that. We have like, now we ask for, for more questions, we have like five. So we're going to go fast. I'm going um, Mar to handle Marjorie's. Uh, I know Marjorie. Okay, uh, David Wilson asked, what's your revenue breakdown between service and production? You don't have to say numbers, you can just maybe do the-, the uh, Percentages. Uh, it's up to you. Yeah, um, right now uh, we're probably 60%, 60% revenue in service and 50% in production. Great. Um, Anything you can open up around the list of services covered under the RAM program and um, how much or how little does your crew perform? I'd be happy to share with whoever's asking um, our RAM proposal description and specifications, which might help. And that might spur some more questions um, offline or something like that. Great. Um, we got another question here. Um, okay, uh, Greg, there was a question to you, Greg, directed at you. Uh, do you find the estimators are following up or need to follow up uh, quite a bit, like, like there's a follow-up process, or do you have the coordinator uh, support the estimator um, to do that? Just That's a, a small question, but might be helpful for those listening. Our, our coordinator is purely handling communications with our customers with regard to scheduling and completion and in-progress reports and things like that. Um, our estimators are the ones that are following up on proposals that they've sent. And I don't, we don't have a formalized follow-up process. We will at some point. Um, but our, est our estimators uh, know that they need to check in and, and follow up and see if there's any questions and things like that. And a lot of people just shoot these things off and let them be. That, to me, that's like not responding to a phone call quickly. Um, follow up and ask if there's questions. Show some interest. Show that you're interested in doing their work. Show some interest in how they do their business compared to how you might do business with somebody else. So that's how sort of how we handle it here. Cool. Um, Wellner's asking, what kind of perks do you offer your employees? Or, you know, how do you, you know, create that loyalty within your client base? Uh, we have an onboarding process as far as that goes. Right now, um, our employees are getting two weeks paid vacation, seven paid holidays, 
full medical benefits. It's a lot. And yeah. it's expensive. Um, but we expect a lot of our people and in return will give them those benefits. Would you say that your turn in? So you do have experience in other organizations and you also have experience listening in peer group meetings that you sit in. Would you say your turnover is on par or better than most? Way better than most. Isn't that interesting? You take care of your employees and they take care of you. Yep. Love it. Well, well uh, Kyle, you're, you've been a great person to have on. I, you know, it's refreshing to just hear somebody who is in there as a leader, uh, responsive, you know, leading by example, uh, just doing, doing the, doing what you say you're going to do and doing it well. And I think it sounds like, you know, with your experience, you're just laying an incredible foundation for, you know, a long-term successful business at James King. And, um, it's, it's exciting. So it's, it's good. I know whenever you do decide to start building out the sales infrastructure, you'll have a great foundation for someone to, to, to be successful with. Can I interrupt for a second, Ryan? Yeah. Cause it sounds like you're starting to wrap this up and I, I want to make something explicit for the, the, the audience. You've all been listening now to Kyle talk for about 45 mm -hmm. minutes and let's understand Kyle is a great salesman. And if you listen to how he approaches the answering of your questions, he gives you simple answers without a lot of fluff that, that actually speak to the question. He doesn't go over the deep end this way or over the deep end that way. And all of you, if you're listening to him, know that when he sits down with a building owner, he, he's exactly like this. He doesn't put on a different kind of persona. He inspires confidence. And the people in his organization, some of whom I have met, inspire confidence. So you need to be able to sit down with an owner and you need to be able to present yourself like Kyle does. You need to be low key. You need to figure out what's best for them. And by the way, if you're there to figure out what's best for them, it's a lot easier than if you're there trying to make a sale. But Think about how he's presented all of this today. That's how he goes to owners. And if you start going to owners the way he goes to owners, your success rate will go up too. Ryan, I, I butt it in, but go, I'll let you go back to where you were. Oh, no, that's great. Yeah, no, no worries. So yeah, I hope everybody really enjoyed this. Uh, I know I did. It was great. Thanks, Kyle, for taking your time and answering questions. Uh, I think some people are interested in learning how they can, I mean, I'm going to, we're going to see some emails come in to you. Uh, do you mind just sharing your email address, please? Sure. It's kylek at jameskingroofing.com. And I'd be glad to help anybody out, talk on the phone or via email. That's be great. And Greg, great. I'm, I'm confident because I'm confident that our people that work with me are really good at what they do. That helps. And I, and I have fun doing what I'm doing. I learn something every day. Um, so it makes it easy for me. Awesome. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks for being a bright light. Uh, yes. uh, Kyle K here is a uh, Kyle K at James King Roofing. Correct. Uh, James King Roofing.com. So, yeah. And if you guys are not familiar, Greg Payne has a great program called uh, Creating Great Service. And I know Kyle's been a student of Greg's and they've done business together. So, uh, you know, Kyle is a smart guy, capable, but also learned from Greg. Yeah. So, um, it's important to know that you guys are able to uh, access, you know, the minds and experience of people like Greg. And uh, yeah, so that's important. If you guys want to do that, go to creatinggreatservice.com or uh, hangcoachinggroup.com. Either one. <clears throat> Either one. Go to hangcoachinggroup.com. It'll take you to creating great service or creatinggreatservice.com. Yeah. And so my message to the group is a little different. Today, we have probably spent more time talking about the nuts and bolts operational aspects of uh, service than about revenue generation. Because Kyle, other than Kyle, doesn't really have any great salespeople work. They're all salespeople, but he doesn't have an in-place sales revenue generation process. What I want you all to know is that I partner with Ryan, not because he's good, but because he is exceptional. And what I tell everyone 
Sorry, Ryan, but I have to say this. It's, if, always, a, it's always a little jolting when you say I, that. I know, but he is exceptional. If, if you, when you get to the point where you need people, if you hire him, and if it doesn't seem to be working, it's because you're not doing it or you have the wrong people. He is exceptional. So it's, it's not sure thing because you got to have the right people, but you got the right people, it's almost a sure thing. And he will make your business explode. In a good way, though. Not in a, a, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you'll make it. All you operators, that's like a that's a bad word. We got to use the right word. No, so, no this word is good. You prefer Brian, other than uh, explode. Uh, you, 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 your profits will increase nicely, and you'll you'll. Oh, you'll explodes more fun. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, but yeah, so we're going to wrap up. So thanks, everybody. Uh, you can reach out to us, uh, you know, LinkedIn, email, salestransformationgroup.com is our is my website. Greg has a hand coaching group and creating great service.com. And then Kyle's uh, email is right in here. We'll send out uh, a recording, kind of a recap email for those who uh, have registered. And we, uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next one. Actually, the next one. The next one is at the, the IRE. Is at the IRE. So uh, if you guys are not going to be at the IRE, thanks, Michael, by the way, for the shout out. If you guys go to the IRE, it's going to be in New Orleans. We're going to do a live unlocking service growth session. We're going to have not just one, not two, not three, but four panelists. And it's going to be a great time. So we hope to see you there. And uh, yes, until next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Thank thanks, you. Kyle.